All right. So, um, so this whole time we've been looking at cheeseburgers and pizza and other things. What was the characteristics of private goods? Not public goods, but private goods. What are the two characteristics of private goods? What do private goods like beer and pizza rival and exclusive? Rival and exclusive. <laughs> so, um, when we think about the demand for a good, if we're thinking about a private good, so we could, I'm not going to, I don't want to list it, I'm just trying to motivate the concept here. This is cheeseburgers, beer, chicken wings, whatever. The demand curve captures society's benefit by the people who consume it. So we said that the marginal benefit curve is the demand curve. The people who consume the cheeseburger get the benefit from the cheeseburger. Those people are members of society, and therefore the society's marginal benefit is embodied in the people who consume that good. So all three of these concepts were equal to each other for starters. Now, if we change this to flu shots, what did we say was true about the flu shots in terms of the benefits of it? <coughs> that what? Making a joke? What's true about the flu shot I'm going to get in about 50 minutes? It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt, thank you. Thanks hurt. for that reminder. That one doesn't feel like smearing <laughs> What was true about the benefits? Why am I doing it again? Because you don't want so to get the flu. So I don't want to get the flu. But what was true about the benefits of the flu shot in addition to that? You're one less person contributing to the contagion to yes. society. So society's benefit is something bigger than my individual benefit. How do we model that with this? Where does the social benefit... So the social benefit is no longer equal to the private benefit. We're breaking this link. We're breaking that link. Where does the social benefit curve lie in relationship to the private benefit curve. It's above it. That's right. So, if, if this is, I guess we could do a rust benefit curve with one flu shot. Uh, I don't know how many additional flu shots are going to help me out here. I said one, I said one, put down two on the board. But if I'm willing to pay some money for this flu shot. My willingness to pay, by the way, is probably, I'm putting myself on the spot. Getting it for free. <laughs> I'd pay $3 for it. That's what I'm willing to pay. Don't tell the insurance company and OU that I'm gonna get it for free this afternoon, but I'm willing to pay three bucks. Now, I told you how much they cost at Walgreens. How much was it? 30. 32. I'm not willing to pay that. I'm out of the market at 32, right? But I'm in the market if it's three. So I'm going to pay three. And society is going to benefit more than three. I'm willing to, I get $3 worth of benefit. Society gets something more. I'm not even going to put a number with it. Right? Now if two people, now I'm gonna I'm just kind of motivating the story rather than thinking about me getting another flu shot, which doesn't make much sense, right? But if we have two, three, four, five, if we start thinking about the quantity of flu shots getting more and more, if three people in Ottawa get flu shots, those three people benefit that much, but society benefits that much. <coughs> if Five people get flu shots. Five people benefit that much. Society benefits that much. And 
And so the marginal social benefit curve lies above the private benefit curve. <coughs> now, if we have a, let's just do a constant marginal cost, I guess, for this one, just to keep it simple. Let's say that flu shots run about 50. If the marginal cost of a flu shot is about 50, in other words, if we take all of the resources necessary to put that little fluid in that little container and the person who's there to depress the plunger into my arm, right? All of the costs of the flu shot are embodied in the price of the flu shot at the margin. So the dollar fifty covers all of the cost of society's resources necessary to generate those flu shots. So therefore, the company's cost is about fifty, and as long as that company's not polluting the environment at the same time that they're making the flu shots, those costs reflect society's cost of additional flu shots, which is again our baseline assumption in the marketplace. Now, when I asked you for your hunch, you told me what about whether flu shots in general, if left alone, there'd be too many flu shots or not enough flu shots relative to society's optimal number of flu shots. <coughs> too much or too little if we just leave the free market do its thing? Probably too little. Too little, right? Because I am not taking into account the fact that I'm helping you guys out. I just care about myself, that I don't want to get the flu. So the market solution will be here, where the marginal benefit of the last flu shot, the private benefit, equals the private cost, which happens to be the social cost. In other words, there's going to be three flu shots. Maybe this is measured in thousands, so we can help uh, motivate it. So we're going to have 3,000 <coughs> flu shots in the city at about 50. All right, so this is the quantity this would be kind of the uh, market quantity. And really it's the free market quantity. So with a free market leaving private businesses produce flu shots and sell them, leaving private households like me, myself purchase flu shots, with a free market, the quantity equals three, 3,000. What's that? You had it where it intersects the marginal <coughs> benefit, not the marginal revenue curve. Yeah, th this is just looking at the entire market, so okay. supply and demand. So the, by the way, our marginal cost curve here is also the supply curve, if you want to add another link on here. So we're just saying supply, this was kind of a simplifying assumption. We, don't have, we could do upward sloping, which we will later. So where is the optimal amount of flu shots on our <coughs> island if we're trying to do what's best for optimal a number of flu shots for our island, where does that occur? Would it be to the right where it intersects with the marginal social benefit? Yep. So social benefit and social cost gives us the <coughs> allocatively efficient solution for society. So this is no longer happening. Make sure you kind of put a big X through that. Because of the positive externality, this is that external effect a third party not directly related to the transaction is benefiting from it. And so society's benefits capture all of those external effects. The fact that probabilities go low. More people get flu shots, there's going to be less people with flu. And less likelihood even if you didn't get the shot. So the marginal social benefit intersects the marginal social cost here. <coughs> 
at QAE. That's the allocatively efficient solution for society. So, as we saw before, the allocatively efficient solution is where <coughs> marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. <coughs> Therefore, the market underproduces doesn't produce enough, put that in quotes, the market underproduces the good with a positive externality. Questions or comments so far on that? All right, so let me just throw out what could be done. We, we're kind of introducing some places perhaps for government intervention in markets. If the market's here and we'd like to be here, what could be done to bump up this quantity? How could we change the incentive system such that we get more quantity rather than less? If you have okay, so what do you mean? Force people to get them? Okay, so we could mandate that you have to get a flu shot. Okay? Other suggestions? Give them for free, how? How, are we, how does that come about? I mean, we have a company. Can we force this company to give them for free? No. no, God bless America, we're back to that part, right? So we can't force the company to give them for free. So what could be done to create that? I'm not saying that's not a, a decent idea. I'm getting it for free, like I said. But what would you need to do to create a situation where you're getting it for free? Money has to come from somewhere else. Government gives them money. Okay, so what do we call that when the government gives money? So subsidy. subsidy. So we could subsidize this. So if the government comes in and subsidizes the activity, then that would tend to increase the quantity. And that's what we saw back when we did this in chapter six, right? The subsidy ended up having QS to the right of where the market was at. When we imposed the tax, what happened to the quantity that was being exchanged? It went to the left. Subsidies brought it to the right, taxes brought it to the left. So we might be able to subsidize the production. We could subsidize possibly the company and say, hey, we'll give you some tax credits if you um, change your price from buck fifty For every flu shot that you give, we'll give you a 75 cent you know, rebate back. So you could subsidize the company or you could subsidize the consumer. Consumer, go pay a buck fifty for it, and when you file your taxes at the end of the year, show me that you bought that, and I'll give you money back for it. Right? So that, that could be a couple mechanisms. Either way, the point with that is that it doesn't matter who we give the money to, because we learned that we'll get the same result at the end of the day in terms of quantities. We'll get the same result whether we subsidize the producer or subsidize the consumer. Taxes and subsidies are shared between consumers and producers, as long as we have uh, some slope, which we actually don't in this case, with a, a perfectly elastic supply. Okay, now let's flip gears a little bit to this being uh, a public good. Maybe we did decide to um, uh, vote on uh, providing this through tax revenue or something. Uh, maybe we can just switch gears to thinking about uh, national defense and where we end up. So I want to think about a voting outcome. What is the voting outcome? If we try to solve 
problems by going to the voting booth. Do we get an efficient solution? So, whether it's missiles or flu shots or whatever, we have a marginal benefit curve that is downward sloping. The demand for a, whatever this good is, maybe it's missiles. We derived that last time. We calculated it a little differently because of the non-rivalry of the good, but the marginal social benefit was equal to the sum of the individual benefits. We added them up. Remember that? We took Tom and Dick and we added up their who, how they value missiles, and we could construct society's marginal benefit curve. Now, let's put in a good old-fashioned marginal cost curve for missiles. So now we're a missile manufacturer. No reason to believe that the missile guy can get away from the law of diminishing marginal product and therefore faces an upward sloping marginal <coughs> cost curve. And as long as the missile guy is not polluting the atmosphere, it's likely or our, kind of our standard case is that the society's benefits are reflected in the company's costs. Right, or society's cost is reflected in the company's cost. Since the company's a member of society and there's no external benefits or costs, then we're okay. So here we've got private social benefit, social costs, the optimal number of weapons. Maybe we got AR-15s or something, some sort of gun, some, some missile shells. I don't know what, what we've got here. But we know that society's allocatively efficient quantity is right there. Okay, so um, the question would be, does our democratic political system get to that quantity? Right? Through a voting mechanism of majority rule, do we end up getting QAE? Do we have the right amount of national defense? Do we have the right amount of national parks? Do we have the right amount of whatever good that's provided by the government? Is that the correct amount through a voting mechanism? All right. So how many of you voted in the last presidential campaign? At least half. Those of you who were brave to... Uh, I did my democratic... Duty. You did your... Did your Function. Do you feel like you made a difference? Yes. No. It's my job. No. Democracy. All right, those of you who didn't vote, I'm not going to even come down on you. Believe it or not, I'm not MTV. Get up and vote. And you got to vote. Oh, thank God you're not Why MTV. didn't you vote? Didn't want either of them. Didn't want either of them, okay. You're only 17, fair enough. Wanted to make a difference. What's that? Wanted to make a difference. You wanted, no, I said, were you a voter or a non-voter? Voter. You're a voter. Okay, I want the non-voters. Oh, okay. Yeah, the non-voters. Why didn't you vote? So we have somebody that's not of age, that's fine. You didn't give a rip about either candidate, or didn't want both, so you're like, why bother? Fair enough. What else? Who's my non-voters? Be proud to be a non-voter and tell me why the heck you didn't vote. Just turned 18 and you have to wait a certain amount of time, so age. Okay, so you were age also. Other reasons other than age? Yeah? I didn't really know any of the candidates very well and I didn't want to register and vote, just wing it and vote. So. Okay, good, good. So you were not, you didn't feel informed about it, right? So you didn't feel informed, so, uh, you know, I might as well go and flip a coin. If you didn't learn about the candidates, then do you belong in the voting booth at all? Now, why didn't you learn about the candidates? Because I'm guessing there's others of you, Sawyer, you can answer if you want, but why didn't you learn about the candidates and the issues? I was too busy. Too busy! Nobody got time for that. So, are you saying that you, did, you made a rational choice, Sawyer? You're like, let's see, should I study for this test and, and keep my focus on schooling? and spend a lot of time, and I still need some time for socializing, and I still need this, and the, <coughs> so you thought to yourself, 
the benefits that I get from learning about this and the cost I get about learning about this, if it takes a lot of time to learn about the candidates, about issues you don't really care about, right? So if the cost of learning about the candidates is greater than the expected benefits, opportunity cost is included, time studying, blah, 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 is it rational to not learn about the candidates? If the expected cost is greater than the expected benefit, should you be learning about the candidates and voting? No. Nope. You're pretty darn smart, actually, doing it that way. Right? So if you think about whether this is worth it for me to do it or not, it kind of changes the answer around. So a lot of people are what economists call rationally ignorant. What does it mean to be ignorant? Does that mean you're stupid? You don't know. You don't know, so you're uninformed, right? So economists came up with this concept of rational ignorance because we're like, well, what if, uh, what if people aren't informed? In other words, to come to this solution in the voting booths, we have to be informed about the benefits of additional missiles and the cost of additional missiles, or the benefits of, a, of this candidate over the costs associated with the policy platforms that this candidate's putting forward, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of time to put in, right? Yeah. And so what economists did by doing their thing about thinking about incentives is came up with this concept of rational ignorance. Rational ignorance. So rational ignorance is pretty much simply staying uninformed, staying ignorant. So staying uninformed, choosing to stay. You're making kind of a decision on your own. It's not because you overslept and you forgot to get to the uh, voting booths. But you stay uninformed because... The expected marginal cost of being informed is greater than the expected marginal benefit, which is perfectly rational. If you took into account all of the costs associated with being informed versus the benefit, which I haven't even talked about the big thing, in order for you to really make a difference, as MTV points out, what has to be true when you go to the voting booth? In order for you to really make the difference, what needs to be true about your vote when you go to the polls? You are the pivotal vote. Out of all the Americans that go out and vote on the presidential campaign, you would have to be the linchpin, right, that actually tilted the scale the other way. How many one vote elections do we have? How many elections come down to one vote nationwide? What do you think? The, just guess, by the way, I don't know the answer to this, but what would you speculate Probably. is the percent yeah. of votes that come down to one vote? And I don't even care if you go down to the city level, city, state, national level, how many of those things come down to one vote? Are we talking about the popular vote or the electoral vote? Well, whatever would make a difference. If it's a popular vote in a you know in a local campaign in a mayor in a mayor election here in Ottawa, the popular vote is what would probably dictate. So, but either system where you're the where you're the linchpin, it's close to goose egg, right? It's close to zero. So if we start now putting a probability of the benefits, so you might have expected benefits. Well, I really hope that Obama gets in office because I really support all of his issues and stuff. I really hope that he does versus the other candidate, but now you associate the probability of your vote being that vote that gets your candidate into office, then it's all the more compelling that even in that case, you may choose not to go vote. Rational ignorance is a very powerful thing in the uh, voting booths and in the democratic system. 
Now that we've got that under control, do we tend to be this way or this way with quantities of public goods? Given that issue, would we tend to be producing too many public goods or not enough public goods? In other words, is that going to bias things to the right or to the left? I'm going to say to the left. To the left, so not enough goods. Other thoughts? <coughs> That's the thing we really like to focus in on economics here, is start thinking about, well, what are the implications of that? We have people so rephrase that question. Would we tend to be to the right, like we've got too many public goods or not enough public goods, if we have uninformed voters? And I know this is hard because I've kind of bounced back and forth between missiles and presidential candidates. But let's, let's kind of stick with maybe missiles or the number of drinking fountains at the local park or the number of swing sets at our, our playgrounds. Um, we can do a number of different variables. So I kind of generically want to think, do we, does this tend to have more public goods or less compared to the official level? Less or more voters, just that the ratio of voters are uninformed. You want to think about the spending that's going on is what I kind of want to hone in on. Would that tend to have more things bought in the public realm or less things bought? Say more. Go back to your list of incentives. Go back to your list of incentives. Remember in the political marketplace, we had households and firms, and we had politicians and bureaucrats. Which one of those agents might tend to be able to take advantage of uninformed voters. Mm. Bureaucrats. Bureaucrats. Right? Their incentive was to bump up their budget. Now, how does that play through? Check this out now. If we are saying that we should have, instead of 100 missiles or 100 drinking fountains, they come out and say, well, I think 150 drinking fountains is a good number. Well, look at this. There's benefit, of course, with the drinking fountain. Everybody likes water. You know how you've been to the park when it's hot outside, and then there's that drinking fountain, and it just quenches your thirst. Is there benefit to every additional drinking fountain? For the most part, it could be argued that there's some benefit. Take Kansas Park over here. There's one drinking fountain. Could there be two? Yeah, could there be three? Yeah, could there be four? Yeah, there could be additional, there is additional benefit, I would argue, for sure, to more and more drinking fountains. But what's missing from that argument then? So we've got people that might have an incentive to have bigger budgets pushing that. We don't have the same double check on the cost. If the voters are the ones ultimately <laughs> voting on this, and they're like, I don't have time to learn about drinking fountains. Whatever you guys decide, as long as it's majority rule, we're okay. But if everybody thinks that way, then the bureaucrats tend proposing this direction, and with uninformed voters, there's a greater likelihood that it's going to pass, that it's not going to get shot down because people don't give a rip, because they're, they're choosing to be rationally ignorant. That's kind of the story as we think about um, public goods and what might happen. <laughs> this is under the theories of public choice theory. Let me just move this over here so I can write a little bit more. Public choice theory. I call it PCT. Public choice theory in general says, you know what? Voters are likely to be rationally ignorant, and so we're going to end up having more than the efficient quantity is the likely outcome. So public choice theory would say that um, voting by majority leads to overproduction of public goods. Voting by majority leads to overproduction of public goods. Why? Because of rational ignorance. That's the idea. So, what, could we also say that uh, voting by majority is just a, a, a rational 
ignorance then leads to decreasing marginal benefit and increasing marginal cost? Um, the benefit's there automatically, if we think about the benefit of each additional drinking fountain. So it's just that the the fourth drinking fountain doesn't bring as much benefit as the third. Right, so, so we're that's decreasing marginal benefit and right. increasing marginal cost. And increasing marginal cost, yes. Okay. Yep. Which is kind of back to just the normal story, I guess is what I'm trying to, not, not, not anything special to this. All right, so that's rational ignorance. Um, by the way, if we have fully informed voters, then it's possible that we do get the efficient outcome. Then it's likely that we do. So I wanted to point that out too. I think that the, what the public choice theory folks point out though is that that's fairly unlikely because it's fairly reasonable to be rationally ignorant on, especially when we consider all the number of uh, possibilities that are out there. So social interest theory, social interest theory, in general, I, there's kind of this distinction made. We do get the efficient outcome as long as people are well informed. So we get efficient outcome with well informed voters. So we kind of got these competing schools of thought of which one, which one dominates. And really, I mean, this is where, I, I should say, this is how the theory kind of started off. And then this one became much more prominent. I just happened to catch uh, a show last night. I don't know if any of you did. If I don't watch too much TV, honestly, but I was doing some grading and finishing up that sort of stuff. And they went through the top ten uh, political embarrassments by politicians on all the bonehead stuff that they've done. And they ended, you know, we had... Uh, Wiener, uh, with his sexting debacle, he was number he was number two. Uh, John Edwards, the former presidential candidate, he was ranked number one as the most bonehead one. So he slept around, and then he had a kid, and then he disclosed it, and then that ruined. He was one of the top candidates for president with um, when Hillary Clinton and Obama, right? That was that campaign. Yeah, and then he had the cancer thing, so he went down in flames. So anyway, uh, and then uh, Blagojevich, right, the Chicago guy that sold Obama's seat, put it up for auction basically in Chicago. So anyway, they had all these examples that were just kind of exactly what we're talking about in this class, that self-interest and public interest don't always coincide with each other, and we get some results that aren't, aren't, the, aren't the most optimal. Okay. Um... So, how do we get this result? You know, is there a solution to this problem? What are some things that could be done to make, if this is the quantity we're at, how do we get it back here? Possibly one way to think about it. I'm just trying to think, here's the issue, rational ignorance, are there some things that we could do to help make the situation better? Maybe we'll never get to perfectly this, but think about some policies that could be put into place that would help alleviate rational ignorance. What are some things that could maybe be done? it is information, right? So getting information out. Now that doesn't always work because people don't <coughs> care. So what got to be true about the information? If you're trying to structure how to deliver the information, what would we need to do? We might kind of do it naturally anyway, but structure it towards a target audience. Okay, structure it, make it accessible, make it cheaper, right? The cost, if we go back to this equation, the expected cost versus the expected benefits, if we make it real easy for you to stay informed, then you're likely to stay more informed, right? We're lowering the cost 
um, acquiring the information. So maybe we can use the latest technology to try to deliver information that it's more at your fingertips. And so we start tweeting and we start doing other things to where you might pick up, you might be more interested in the information if it was more accessible. So that would be some ways that we could do it. Um, I, I think uh, one of the lessons learned or being learned all the time is uh, advertising during the political season. Right? Do we get overwhelmed or is there just not enough to find during campaigns? It's just, it's mind boggling, right? And then we think about the waste of resources that are going in. We've got people hungry in the world, right? So hunger for change has got a big effort here on campus. How many millions of dollars go into these political campaigns? Is there a better thing that we could be doing with that money? I suspect the answer is yes, right? Can we structure that information flow differently so that it's a heck of a lot cheaper? Maybe we should ban all advertising on ads. You know, did that happen to cigarettes and booze? TV advertising? Yeah. yeah. Now that's booze has kind of snuck back in here lately on, on TV. But the Marlboro Man restrictions, if you go to Australia, you, they can't advertise at all for cigarettes. They just have this generic label even. They can't even make it like neon green and make it jump out at you on the cash register. So I think the political realm could take a few lessons from cigarettes and booze. And maybe we should figure out other ways to more effectively get messages out to people and take those dollars that we're wasting on all the other advertising and put it towards other social causes. Or reduce spending, and maybe we could even balance budget or something. I don't know. Who knows? What? Maybe I'm too. Uh... <laughs>